It's good to be with you again. Our title today is America, It's Time to Return to God. And I believe that is absolutely the truth. But I'm not really imagining that the pagans or the ungodly need to change. It needs to start in the hearts of those of us who fill the churches or imagine ourselves to be Christ followers. It's time to return to God. Now, it's, we're not the first generation with this challenge. In fact, it's laced all through the scripture, multiple invitations, multiple times, God pleads with his people to return to him. And I believe the shaking that we're walking through from supply chains interruptions to COVID virus challenges and everything in between is God shaking us, saying, please turn your attention to me in a new way. Let's respond to him. Grab your Bible and a notepad, but most of all, let's listen for the invitations of the Spirit of God. I believe God called this nation into existence. I don't believe it came about just as the result of human decisions. I believe Almighty God called us into existence. I know it's not fashionable right now to be patriotic, but I am. I know it's more chic to be a globalist, but I'm not. But then I've never been accused of being fashionable or chic, so it's okay with me. What I do want to do is understand the heart of God. I don't want to cultivate some sort of crude, jingoistic nationalism that imagines that America supersedes everything else. I've been telling you or reminding you that we all carry dual citizenship. You have citizenship to some nation state on planet Earth. Most of us, I suspect, are citizens of the United States. But you also have a spiritual citizenship, either to the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God. Your earthly citizenship related to a nation state is temporary. You have a temporary visa. You have a visitor's pass. The Bible describes us as being aliens and strangers here, pilgrims on a, on a temporary sojourn. And the encouragement, the counsel of Scripture is not to become so fully engaged in the temporary that we forget the perspective of the eternal kingdom to which we belong. So we all carry a passport that identifies us with some nation state, and that brings with it some rights and privileges and some responsibilities. And I believe whatever nation you're from, you have a responsibility to pray and be a light in that place. I had a conversation today with a gentleman from the Congo, and he has a burden on his heart for the people of Congo, that they would come to know Jesus and the blessings that he brings to their life. He had complete clarity that the only thing that would bring a better future to that nation was Jesus. I pray the citizens of this nation have that same awareness that the only thing that will bring a better future to us is Jesus. It's not ultimately a political battle or an ideological battle or about parties or individuals or Congress or a Supreme Court or governors or mayors. It's a spiritual decision. So my first question is which kingdom, which eternal kingdom are you aligned with? It's far more significant than your nationality. Don't be a hyphenated Christian. Don't put something in front of your, your identification with Christ. My New Testament says that in Christ, we're neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. It's not about our sex. It's not about our nationality. We are first and foremost Christ followers. So you're either consciously, by decision, a Christ follower, that you have acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah and you have accepted him as Lord of your life and serve him in that way, or by default, if you haven't done that intentionally, by default, you're a participant in the kingdom of darkness. That's the one you're born into. And, and there's no way, you, can't, you don't join the kingdom of God like you join a club. It's not by joining a church and getting a membership card or going through a class and completing the requirements. It's a personal choice. And it's not based upon perfection. God's made provision for all of our inadequacies and all of our failures and all of our ungodliness so that we can participate in his kingdom. It's an expression of grace. But having said that, I believe we have a responsibility to the nations where God plants us to be salt and light. It makes no sense to me to imagine you're going to be a missionary to someplace else until you have been a missionary to the people across your back fence. In fact, I'm really not interested in sponsoring your... your interest in missions until I find out that you have been a very effective advocate for Jesus on the block where you live. I have traveled enough to know it's much easier to be bold for Jesus someplace where you don't speak the language. Because I may be there for a week, I may be there for a month, but in, in, in some period of time, I'm getting on a plane and leaving. 
But to honor Jesus someplace where you live with people week in, month in, year in, is a greater challenge. They've seen you kick the dog across the backyard. Or whatever expression of ungodliness you prefer. If you love dogs, forgive me. My father was a veterinarian. We considered that a win when you kicked the dog. So, never mind. I believe we have a responsibility to pray for our nation. And, and as, a, as a student of history, I can tell you one thing. It's, it's simply an inescapable fact that our nation's history is inseparable from the Christian faith. We have verses of scripture carved in our most celebrated buildings and monuments all across our nation. Our legal system, our educational system, the, the principles upon which our businesses have operated, the things that have brought the blessings of God to us have not been our natural resources or our industri industriousness or some unique ethnicity because we're a melting pot. We've come from all the nations of the world. It's been that faith, that worldview that has held us together. Our first universities, our most celebrated universities were founded as training institutions for Christian ministers. Again, a very clear part of our history. Those who founded our nation were Christ followers. It's not a perfect story, but no group of people have a perfect story. And I find it unacceptable that the Christian faith and the Christian heritage of our nation is diminished or criticized or belittled because we haven't been perfect people. We don't hold that attitude about other people's. We don't hold that attitude about any group of people you imagine. We celebrate their, their right to worship however they chose to worship. And we don't link outcomes of their chosen faith with the outcomes in their lives. We simply respect their right to worship however they choose. And I'm offended by those that look at the Christian faith and begin to tear it apart and diminish it because we have chapters in it that are less than stellar. That's true, but that's ours to process, not some outsiders attacking our faith. And I want to say to Christians, stop apologizing because you're a Christ follower. If you like to play baseball, you don't apologize because the Houston Astros were cheaters. You just like baseball. And we've apologized long enough. We have flaws and weaknesses. We will acknowledge those and admit those, but it doesn't diminish the commitment we have to Jesus or the recognition that our faith is brought to our nation. But it's our assignment to see that that heritage is continued. It doesn't take long for a worldview to be lost. In fact, in this session, I want to talk to you about America returning to God because we're not close to him. We're not even in the neighborhood. I don't think we're in the time zone. We need to return to God. The good news is we're not the first group of people to wander. We're not the first generation to lose our focus. In fact, it's clear in Scripture that from the time God began to develop a people for himself, that he understood human nature, that we would not be able to hold the course, that he needed, there would have to be provision made for us to return to him. I brought you some samples, Nehemiah chapter 1. I chose, we could have started in Deuteronomy, but the list would have gotten too long. I didn't think you wanted to stay that late. This is Nehemiah. Remember Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the Persian king? So the exile has taken place. The, the children of Israel have already made it to the promised land. They've lived there for hundreds of years. They lost their place because of their unfaithfulness. They want to return to the land, but returning to the land is a secondary component in, in, that comes, grows out of returning to God. See, if we will return to God as the church in this nation, we will see God's blessings come again. Nehemiah 1 verse 8, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. In this particular case, admittedly, Nehemiah is reminding God of his promise to bring the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob back to a place on planet earth. But the principle holds true for returning to serving God because their right to dwell in that land, that promised piece of inheritance, was connected to their spiritual condition. The reason they lost their place in the land was the condition of their heart. Again, the reason we have been blessed has had more to do with our heart condition than our natural resources. 
And if God's people will give attention to our heart, we will see changes come in our schools, in the way we treat one another, in the peace with which we can live together with respect and dignity we will give to one another. Jeremiah chapter three, Jeremiah is the prophet in Jerusalem when judgment is about to come. The shadow of Babylon has already fallen over the city and Jeremiah's message, his life assignment is to tell the people of Israel, Judah and Jerusalem that there's nothing they can do. Judgment's coming. It does not make him popular. And there are hundreds of voices on the other side of the discussion that say Jeremiah is just grumpy. He's a little negative. He's always got a half glass half full. I mean, sorry, a glass half empty. But nevertheless, in Jeremiah, nevertheless, Jeremiah delivers the message in verse chapter three and verse six. During the king of Josiah, during the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, have you seen what faithless Israel has done? Now, he's going to talk about two nations. After King Solomon, there's a civil war. Do you remember? And the northern nation is called Israel. And what's the capital of Israel become? Samaria. And the southern nation is called Judah. And the capital of Judah it's Jerusalem. Israel, the northern kingdom, never had a godly king. And so God handed them over to their enemies earlier than he handed over Judah. It was 721 BC when the Assyrians took that northern nation and scattered them throughout the Assyrian empire. Judah stayed another 150 years in their land. It was 587 when the Babylonians came. So Jeremiah is talking to the people in Jerusalem and But God is going to give reference to what he did to the northern kingdom of Israel. Have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She's gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. He's going to reference the idolatry of the Israelites and, and draw a parallel with adultery in a marriage covenant. I thought after all that she had done, after that she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not. And her unfaithful sister, Judah, saw it. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all of her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister, Judah, had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. And because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stone and wood. In spite of all this, her unfaithful sister, Judah, did not return to me with all her heart, but only in pretense, declares the Lord. That's a difficult message to have to deliver. To stand in front of a group of people and say, you're spiritually adulterous. You have a pretense but you're unfaithful to God. The hope that God had held out was that the people of Judah would return to him. That's my hope for our nation. Not to declare our faithfulness, not to assert our righteousness, not to point at what we have done, but to begin to try to imagine what it would look like for us to return to the Lord because there shouldn't be, I don't think, much question that God has begun judgment upon us. And it's not because of the wicked or the ungodly or the immoral. It's not the someone else's. Judah and Jerusalem didn't go into captivity because the Babylonians had superior military capabilities. They may have had that, but God had defended his people on many occasions when they lacked the sophistication to win the victory on physical, by physical means alone. We haven't been a victorious people and a people with freedom and liberty and abundance because we're more clever than the peoples of the world. We've had those things because of the blessings of God. Same book, Jeremiah, further along in the story, chapter 24 and verse six, my eyes will watch over them for good and I'll bring them back to their land. This is God's promise now. For all the heaviness of the message, God also tells Jeremiah to tell the people, I'll bring them back. That's what Daniel read. When Daniel's a slave in Babylon decades later, he's reading Jeremiah and he discovers that it's time for the people to go home. I'll bring them back to this land. I'll build them up and not tear them down. I'll plant them and not uproot them. I'll give them a heart to know me that I'm the Lord and they'll be my people and I'll be their God for they'll return to me with all their heart. That's my prayer for us. That those of us that have been around churches and dabbled in church and been engaged with church and we know the routines of church, that we will return to the Lord with our whole heart. 
not with pretense. It's not just Jeremiah, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. Chapter three, ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. I think it's important that we understand that what we are living through, what we're experiencing is not something new. It has happened over and over and over again. So our willingness to acknowledge that it's true of us is important. Let's not pretend that we're above it, we're aloof, we're removed from it, that we're some uniquely faithful generation. We are not. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord. This is our watch. This is our field to work. These are our harvest fields. What will be said of our generation? When our stories are lined up against the individuals in the book of Acts that we know so well, what will be said of us? Do you think we're going to be graded on a curve? Ever since the time of your forefathers, you've turned away from my decrees and you haven't kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. But you ask, how are we to return? This next verse is more familiar to some of you. I wasn't sure we understood the context. The the context, God's talking about you're far from me. Once again, you've wandered far from me. Return to me, he says, and I'll return to you. How are we to turn? Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? How do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Do you you have the imagination that how you handled your material possessions is an expression of worship? I'm not asking for anything tonight. But again, we have separated our lives so far from God. Our heart has been so far from God. We've asked these questions around giving and generosity and what do we need to do for the Lord? And it's, it's like an intrusion. We go, you know, I don't believe that. Or we, we find somebody who's mishandled something, so we think we're excused from that responsibility. Folks, that's not what it's about. It's about our heart. What matters to us? What has a hold on our hearts? What do we give ourselves to? What do we long for? What do we strive for? It's such an important question. It's really the objective of this lesson. Can America return to God? Can the people that imagine themselves to be God's people? Jeremiah is talking to God's covenant people. He's not preaching to the remainders of the Canaanite nations. He's not preaching to the Babylonians or the Egyptians or the Assyrians. He's talking to the covenant people of God. And we've got to come to grips with this. There's a different response that needs to be elicited from us. And you're in church on a Wednesday night, so I know I'm preaching to the choir. Sometimes the choir needs a good sermon. (laughs) Let's take just a minute and look at what the scripture says about this refusal to follow God. It doesn't surprise God. You know, once upon a time, I I, I spent a lot of time with horses and you get to know their character and their attitude and, and it's pretty predictable. You can tell their attitude by their, their body language, what they do with their ears and you know, how they're moving. You can tell whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood, whether it's safe to be in the space with them or you need to be a little more cautious. And it's predictable. It's predictable around feeding time or, I mean, it's just, there's a rhythm to it. And the Bible tells us that God is not caught off guard by human behavior but he's made provision for it and he has identified a pathway whereby human beings can be godly. So the real fundamental, the simple question on the table is do we want to be godly? In fact, if you don't take anything else away from this session, I would hand you that idea. To what extent do you really intend to be godly? I know we want to go to heaven. I mean, if there's a hell, nobody, who would in their right mind would want to go there? So yeah, if the question is heaven or hell, I'd go for heaven. But kind of setting that aside for a minute, between here and there, do you really want to be godly? Or do you think it's more fun to be ungodly? You just want enough godliness to be sure you don't go south. I don't mean Alabama. (laughs) Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans is one of the most masterful theological treatises that has ever been penned. 
And Romans chapter one describes the downward progression of human character when we reject God. And it begins with two fundamental choices that humans make. It said, although, that although we know there is a God, it's not in your notes, but it's in Romans 1. Although we know there is a God, we refuse to glorify him. And we refuse to give thanks. We will not give to God the glory he is due. He's not like us. It says that the, the invisible qualities of God, his power and his majesty are made known in his creation. And I'm, I'm perplexed by the stubbornness with which we refuse to acknowledge God as creator. There, there's just no logic in evolution. What do you know that gets better when left alone? The fundamental principle of physics is that energy is moving. It, it, we're unwinding. We're moving from a state of order to disorder. Even science argues against evolution. But we were willing to embrace it because we didn't want to accept if there's a creator, you would have a responsibility towards him. So if you think your education is so stellar that it keeps you from believing in God as creator, begin to quietly say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me. I understand the tug of war. My, my college career began in the basic sciences. I had a lot of courses and we, in, in some big words around evolution. But the book of Romans says, if you reject God as the creator, you're going to spiral down from there. And then it walks, I didn't give you the whole portion, but I brought you a portion. So since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, we just didn't want to dwell on God. God gave them over to a depraved mind. You'll either fill your mind with God or your mind will become increasingly filled with depravity, which is kind of a fancy word for ungodliness. To do what ought not to be done. You see, if there's a, if there's a creator, there, is, there are things that should be done and things that shouldn't be done. And that is the fundamental problem because we're a race of rebels. I don't want anybody telling us there's a better way that there is objective truth. We prefer my truth and your truth. Here a truth, there a truth, everywhere a truth, truth. I've watched the corruption of that system. I've lived long enough to see the corruption of that system. Remember when the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, fought for the freedom of speech. I've watched them defend some of the most heinous behaviors in defending the principle of free speech in this nation. I've watched them in this season when there is a systematic attempt to censor free speech. And that group of people has lost their voice. It's not about free speech, it's about power. Christians have been incredibly naive. There is objective truth. You can know the truth. I gotta go, come on. Quit pulling me off topic. <laughs> Verse 29, they become filled with every kind of wickedness. And they list about 19 aspects of human character that will deteriorate if you reject the knowledge of God. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips. You got gossips in the same category with murder, Envy and strife. Don't be a gossip. Don't wrap it in a prayer request. It's still gossip. Don't wrap it in a feeling, a leading, a prompting. Slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, and although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. What's most startling to me about that degradation, that list of degradation, is the people that are walking that path know it's inappropriate. But they choose it for themselves and they will approve of those who will do it. Now, we know that's true from our own participation in an observation of human activity, right? 
If you're going to misbehave, don't you want to recruit somebody to misbehave with you? Nobody's going to answer that one in church. Okay. Well, the Bible tells us as the closer we come to the end of this age, the more we will see that pattern escalate. It's going to increase. It's going to gain momentum. There's a tipping point at somewhere. Some of it is because spiritual forces of wickedness will be unleashed in unusual ways. It'll be as if barriers are taken down. Things will be unleashed. We're coming to the end of the age. The kingdom of darkness knows that to some extent. And there's an intentionality and intensity of their efforts to destroy humanity. See, when you become a Christ follower, you become automatically engaged in a spiritual conflict. You have an adversary. Satan hates God. He forfeited his place there. Human beings are the the crowning achievement of God's creation on planet Earth. And Satan's objective is your destruction. Jesus said it in John 10. He said, I came that you might have life and have it to the full, but the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to, to destroy. You don't want to tolerate evil or imagine you can manage it. It's going to escalate. Jude 1 and verse 17. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said in the last times there'll be scoffers. They'll follow their own ungodly desires. Can, can we admit we all have ungodly desires? If you can't admit it about yourself, you can admit it about somebody you live with. We all have that tug of war within us. Which desire will we follow? What will we yield to? In the last times, there'll be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. They are men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and don't have the spirit. I've never seen a time when division was more rampant in our nation. We're divided about things we shouldn't be divided about. We're divided about things that should be easily unifying principles, not dividing points. There's a spirit in work. But what opened the door for the spirit is our own willingness to follow those ungodly desires. Again, the church has enormous influence on the outcomes of this when we return to the Lord. 2 Peter 3 and verse 3. First of all, you must understand. This is Peter writing near the end of his life. He's about done. He tells you in the letter, the the tent that I'm living in, my earthly body is about done. I'm about to leave. And now he says, you, first of all, you must understand this. He's got my attention. In the last day, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They're going to make fun of you because you choose godliness. But our decision is to follow godliness. They're going to follow their own ungodly desires. They'll say, where is this coming you've promised? You believe in a fantasy. You're you're antiquated. You're out of date. You're anachronistic. Peter says, you must understand this. You're not confused. You're not deceived. You haven't been manipulated. Choose to honor the Lord. You remember who wrote the book of Romans? It's not a trick question. Paul did. The Romans. (laughs) He wrote it to the church in Rome. He also wrote 2 Timothy. So it's not surprising that there's common thought and common vocabulary and some similarities. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1, Paul says, mark this, there'll be terrible times in the last days. You know, when we talk about the last days, the question always comes up, you know, is is it time for Jesus to return? And I certainly, from what I understand of Scripture and the prophetic passages, um, we are moving into that season when the return of the Lord is drawing closer. There's some big rock issues we could point out. Nobody knows the day or the hour or the, the, the closest anybody would be is a season, and I don't mean an earthly season. But I, I think it's the wrong question. Because if you don't have that sense of, if you, if you have that sense of urgency, many of us have a theology that's kind of an escapist theology. If we're getting close to the Lord's return, we don't need to worry about it because he's going to come get us. You know, it's like we're moving out of here, so we don't really care what's happening in the neighborhood. And then there's another group of people that say, well, you know, they're always saying the Lord's coming, so I'm not paying any attention to that. And and that group of people doesn't have any sense of urgency for their faith. So I I think a a combination of the two is is that somewhere between them is the best place. We live with the awareness that the seasons suggest the Lord could be coming. But it's not just exactly as clear as everybody would like us to believe. 
as to how that series of events is going to unfold, what we are told is when the Lord returns, will he find you busy with his business? So my best counsel to you would be to take every day as if the Lord were coming today, and are you going to be engaged in a set of things you'd like to be engaged in if he were coming? If you live with that attitude, you won't be be caught unprepared. You won't be like the virgins waiting for the bridegroom or the steward who was given the one talent and buried it. You'll be ready. So Paul says, mark this. There's going to be terrible times in the last days. A better translation in that sentence is that the times will be exceedingly fierce. That's a more literal translation. There are going to be fierce times. Okay. It's like the pilot coming on and saying there's going to be turbulence. You can't get off. Probably be better to buckle your seatbelt. They're going to stop serving food for a little bit because you don't want to wear that delicious airplane food. But it doesn't mean the plane's going to crash. It just means we're going to bump along a little bit. If you've never flown before, it makes you panic. But if you've flown very much, you're going, oh, bother, let's go. So you don't have to panic. Don't say, oh, what are we going to do? The Lord will bring you through. There'll be terrible times in the last days. And now there's a listing of 18 or 19 characteristics. And it's very reminiscent of the Romans 1 list. And it's, it describes a deterioration of human character. It feels To, to me, Romans 1 feels like the, 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 theolo- the theological principle. And 2 Timothy is a description of what it's going to actually feel like. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'll have a form of godliness but deny its power. Have nothing to do with them. Very similar to the Romans 1 list, isn't it? Now, what I'm aware of is how quickly we can lose an idea. We've never, I've never lived through a season where change was coming in such magnitude and at such speed. It's disorienting. It's a time of great discontinuity. When there's, when there's significant breaks with previous behaviors or habits. And those are times when you're much more easily manipulated or realigned. So it's very important in times of great discontinuity and turmoil to understand what your foundations are. Because it doesn't take very long to lose an idea. Anybody here ever use a rotary phone? Look at you not raising your hands. How many of you here have never owned a rotary phone? Come on, I know you're in the house. Building's full of them. They're just down there with the younger people. Right? One of the young men that works with me He thought telephone booths were just in the movies as props. (laughs) Remember when you used to have to find a payphone? Did you ever drive around to find a payphone? Because I need to make a call. I need someplace to call, right? Did you ever stop at a gas station for directions? (laughs) One made us think gas stations were filled with people filled with really good directions. Well, all of those are ideas that are lost to us. We had a staff discussion this week and a conversation came up about 9-11 and one of the women that works with us says, well, I was in the nursery when 9-11 happened. I don't have any emotions around that. I don't feel anything when you talk about it. Watch your faces and you people have emotions, but I don't have any emotion. It doesn't take very long to lose an idea. Doesn't take very long at all. So when I hear some of the goofy stuff they're putting in our kids, I I get it's, it's got my attention. Well, with this list, what concerns me is these things have been happening for so long. I think we, God's people, have lost our perspective on what it means to be godly. We not even to return to God seems foreign to us because that list of characteristics describes our world. So I've been playing with this list for a bit, trying to think of what the opposite of what's listed there would be. It's a bit subjective. You don't have to agree with me. But don't just disagree out of hand. If you don't like my choice for the antonym, for the opposite, think of your own. But Paul says, first of all, we'll be lovers of ourselves. 
People will be lovers of themselves. That seems pretty accurate to me. Get your money. Look out for number one. Take care of yourself. If you're doing business, buyer beware. Sound right? What would, it, what would the opposite, if we were going we to move back towards a, a godly perspective, what would that look like on that category? I, I, I noodled that a good bit. I put over there, for me, it was duty. Seems we've lost any sense of duty. Feels like an old-fashioned, how, how quaint. Seen the, the, the memorial of the Marines on Iwo Jima putting the flag up? Those five young men? All of them under 22 years of age. They understood something we've lost. So I think against lovers of themselves, I think it's a legitimate prayer point to walk around saying, Lord, what duty do I have towards your kingdom? Not what do I want? Not what's good for me? We are so far down the hole of being lovers of ourselves. The second one is lovers of money. And that one wasn't easy for me either. What's the, what's the opposite of being a lover of money? It's not hating money. The Bible doesn't tell us to hate money. Streets in heaven are paved with gold. <laughs> You're in love with rocks. <laughs> it felt like contentment was about as good a description as I had. I feel like what the Bible asks us to learn is to be content. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, I'd really like the bread for all of my days, please. But Jesus said, no, trust me. For when God fed the Israelites when they left Egypt and they had these hundreds of thousands of people and no supply lines, their supply lines were interrupted. He said, I'll bring you food every day. Go out and get what you need for the day. Contentment. We're a long way from contentment. So much of what drives us is discontentment. I put one, I put one passage in here. I, I was so tempted to pull the verses for all of these, but maybe another time. 1 Timothy 6. Look at verse 10. It says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is. You don't have to have money to love it. This is not about being rich or poor. Uh, the way they're dividing us around resources is evil. It is evil. You don't have to have money to love it. You don't have to have money to be greedy. You don't have to have much to be selfish. But it says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Well, I believe that's true. And if that's true, you've got to be really careful. Look at the larger passage, verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. From the perspective of our eternal kingdom citizenry, how do you establish great gain in the kingdom of God? Both by pursuing godliness and being content with it. That's a long way from how we live. We don't post a lot of pictures in social media on expressions of our godliness and being content with it. Most of our posts are indiscernible from people who are chasing all the money they can get their hands on. Return to God. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we're going to take anything with us. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Again, it's not a condemnation of money. One of the clearest teachings of Scripture is that God intends to bring blessings to his people. But we have to guard our hearts. The blessings of God upon our nation do not mean he won't bring judgment to us. Any more than the being the covenant people of God, living in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants forever meant that God's judgment wouldn't come there. Lovers of money, contentment. Number three is boastful. Again, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what's the op these things that define our lives. What would it look like if we were going to be more godly? So thinking about the opposite of these became important. It seemed to me that the opposite of being boastful was to be unassuming. 
Can you imagine aspiring to be unassuming? Number four is proud. That one's a little more straightforward. Humility. Cultivate humility. It comes indirectly. Humility grows in your life because of other behaviors. Number five is abusive. Abusive. What's the, again, the opposite. Well, I think it may be respectful. Appreciated or appreciative. We're abusive of things. We don't appreciate them. I've got a right to. I don't have to take care of them. We're abusive to people because we don't have any respect for them. Cultivate respect for other people and an appreciation for things that are available to you. They come as a gift of God. Not because you worked hard. What nonsense. I have friends around the world that work desperately hard just to survive. They don't work to accumulate or to vacation or to... If, if we are fortunate enough to accumulate resources because of our effort, it's the blessing of God. Therefore, we treat it with respect and appreciation. It's the Lord's, it's not mine. He's the one, the Bible says, who gives me the power to accumulate wealth. Again, we've drifted a long way from the Lord. Disobedience to their parents is number six. Obedience to parents would be a good start. But respectful of our parents. This isn't about an age or a time. Ungrateful is seven. We could become more grateful. We could become more responsible. You see, ingratitude, just imagine I have a right to whatever I can put my hands on and I have a right to more. So it isn't just about gratitude, it's being responsible with what's been entrusted to you. Isn't that the message of the, or at least a part of the message of the landowner and the stewards and the talents that was given to them? I took what you gave to me and I, I used it wisely and, and here's what I'm returning. And the answer was, well done. Or depart from me, you wicked, sinful. Ungrateful, unholy. Well, the alternative to that, it seems to me, is to be holy, but pure is perhaps a... Imagine aspiring for purity. We mock purity. We mock it. As if it's unaware, inexperienced. Naive. Number nine, without love. There's more than one Greek word for love. And the word that's used there is the word for family. It's not physical. It's not eros, erotic love or agape, a godly love. It's the word that's used around family. So when it says without love, it's without a sense of responsibility to family. We've lost that. 60 million plus children. We've just aborted. Family is an intrusion. Now, I don't mean spoiling our children. That's not a love of family. If we don't prepare the generations following us to flourish in the world ahead, we don't love them. We're giving them a destructive map for how to negotiate the future. Where was I without love? Number 10, unforgiving. That one's a little simpler. We have to be forgiving people. We're working through Job if you're doing the reading. When you get to the last chapter, please note, God doesn't restore Job's fortunes until he prays for his friends. His friends who God said did not speak rightly to him, did not deal fairly with him. Nevertheless, God says to Job, you'll have to pray to forgive your friends. And when Job does, God's blessings come to him. Forgiveness is not optional. Again, our target is, what would it look like for us to return to God? Rather than the cultural morass that we see on the screens and in our music and our arts and in the slanderous, saying things that aren't fully true, partially true, obscuring the truth to diminish someone so that we gain an advantage. 
That is so normal. We call it marketing or politics or competitive. It's ungodly. The alternative would be truthful, affirming. Find the things that are true and upright and good and tell them. Well, I would lose a competitive advantage. No. Do you understand how deeply ungodliness has affected how we think? We're as lost as the the young people who don't know what 9-11 means. They have no negative emotion attached to that destructive event. And we have very few negative emotions attached to this ungodliness because we've lived in it for so long. Without self-control. I think the alternative is pretty straightforward. Self-control, maybe self-discipline is a little more. It's not our fault. Too many calories in McDonald's food. Thirteen, brutal. We have become a brutal people. The alternative is compassion. Not lovers of the good. We just don't love good. We think the ungodly are having more fun. It's why we encourage our kids to go that way. The alternative is the fear of God, a respect, a reverence for God. Fifteen, we're treacherous. Our motives are not clear. We have private agendas, secret agendas. We're deceitful and deceptive and manipulative. We're treacherous people. The alternative is pure motives. Not hidden. Not obscured. Open, transparent. Number 16 is rash. The alternative would be to thoughtful or to be measured. 17 is conceited, self-centered. Seems like the alternative would be considerate of others. It's just not, not just what's good for me or how will this make me look or how will I appear if this unfolds, but actually considerate of other people. Number 18 is lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Again, we've lived this way for so long, we don't even think of it as inappropriate. I assure you, Jeremiah's audience wasn't sitting around scheming and making a plan on how they could learn to speak Babylonian. They thought they were okay. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, more than lovers of God. The alternative to that, it seems to me, would be a commitment to holiness, purity, a sacrificial faith. Sometimes faith isn't fun. Sometimes the pursuit of God is not comfortable or it's not convenient. We'll do things that we think will bring pleasure. Pleasure is centered in our physical. Happiness is centered in your soul, your emotions, and your thoughts. But pleasure is centered in things that are physical. So when I think about being loving of physical satisfaction, physical pleasure, more than a lover of God, God is spiritual. So I have to give a a higher precedence to spiritual things in my life than I do just to the physical things. And you can take that to an extreme where you become physically abusive of yourself and we have chapters of that in the history of the church. I don't believe that's the instruction. And finally, 19 is, is we have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. Very similar to what was said at the end of the Romans 1 passage. There it says, although they, don't, they know the righteous decrees of God, they don't do them, but they will approve of others who don't do them. And Paul writes to Timothy and he said, there'll be people, this list describes people with a form of godliness, but they'll deny its power, have nothing to do with them. I didn't bring you the passages, but in Paul's thought, when, when the question is, what does he mean by the power of God? And in Paul's thought, it's very clear for Paul, the power of God is centered in the cross. He says to the church in Corinth, I decided when I was with you not to know anything except Christ and him crucified. So they'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the necessity of the cross. You're too focused on sin and depravity and Human beings can work together and we'll get to a better place. Let's just try harder. Let's hold hands, sing a little kumbaya. We need to become more understanding, more tolerant. We certainly don't want to be judgmental or critical. 
Who are we to have an opinion about what's right and wrong? It's not our opinion. It's God's. And we have to have the courage to say, God, I will accept your opinion. I don't want a form of godliness. The alternative to that is to live in the power of the spirit. My time's just about gone. Remember the target, returning to God. You need to live with that list a little bit until the, the, the ideas describing godliness become more real to you, more forward in your thinking and in your emotions than the list of ungodliness. We want to strive for, for an awareness of duty and contentment, to be unassuming and humble and respectful and appreciative, obedience to our, obedient to our parents, grateful, responsible, holy, pure, responsible to family. Not just to care for them and give to them, to teach them to be responsible. Truthful and affirming, self-controlled and self-disciplined, compassionate with the fear of God and pure motives, thoughtful, considerate of others, pursuing holiness and living in the power of the Spirit. That's how we'll return to God, church. That's what it'll look like. You'll need to talk to one another about that. Think about it, discuss it. Where in, our, where in our list of choices and our habits and our recreation and the things we're striving for, do we reflect the things that look like moving towards God? We're perilously, perilously close to losing them completely. You know what happens when they're lost is it takes a real battle to see them reinstated. That's another lesson. God's provision, I want to close with this because I think it's helpful. God's provision comes in two very clear ways to us in Scripture. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, that's this theme in everything we've looked at. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. In the past, he said, God spoke to us through the prophets. Many times, many ways, different signs, fire from heaven, donkeys that chirped. He's talked to us in many ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. What's the one revelation that a son can give that no other representative could? God is father. He's our father. The fatherhood of God is the great revelation that Jesus brought to us. God's provision to overcome that carnal, selfish part of ourselves that takes us towards ungodliness is the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if anybody would be my disciple, you have to take up your cross daily. I just thought I had to take it up one time and come to the altar and say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner, and then I could just go. Wait for the trumpet and the lift off. God's son is part of his provision, but it doesn't stop there. Acts chapter two, Peter stood up with the 11. This is the day of Pentecost. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. It always makes me smile. It's a little early for us. Oh, it's okay to laugh at that in church, I promise. It's okay. I'm not encouraging drunkenness. Verse 16, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. I'll pour out my spirit on all people and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. God's provision for us to overcome that carnal, selfish nature that takes us away from God. The pathway back to return to God begins in the redemptive work of Jesus. But then we have to add to that or combine with that the help and guidance and direction of the Spirit of God. Isn't that what Jesus said to us? In John, when he's preparing his disciples for his exit, he said, there's so much I have yet to say to you but it's more than you can bear right now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He'll take what is mine and make it known to you. 
So Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost. He's talking to the group of people that shouted crucify him a few days ago. They had blood on their hands. And he said, let me explain to you what's happening. God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, he said. But then he says to us that God said in the last days he would pour out his spirit on all people. So what's the pathway back? How do we return to God? We come to the cross as individuals and say, God, have mercy on me. And then we ask the Holy Spirit to begin to help us. Give us new eyes to see and new ears to hear and new hearts to receive. We have to return to the Lord. That's our pathway through this. Not new politicians, not new parties, not new voting procedures. Amen? Amen. Can we make that prayer together? My time's up. They're going to release teenagers. Why don't you stand with me? I'm going to say a prayer for us, but I would encourage you to take that little list from 2 Timothy 3. You can use your own antonyms. You can make up your own opposites, but what you want to meditate on and think about is that list of things that will describe godliness. And to what extent are they growing in you? And what extent are they a part of your conversation with the people that you interact with? To what extent do you choose friends based on that set of characteristics? To what extent are you coaching your children to value those things, to aspire to those things? It's so important. They will be gone from us. They'll be as distant from us as a phone booth or a phone book. (laughs) Who wants one of those? Or a fold-up map. Right? If you could refold the map, you are led by the Spirit. You talk about losing the love of Jesus, right? I think there were demons assigned to mess up that map when you tried to refold it. I'd buy the Atlas so I could at least look cool. My maps were always okay. We don't, we can't afford to lose our perspective on godliness. We're not the first generation. Josiah, they lost the Bible. We've almost, just almost. Father, thank you. Thank you for a season of shaking. Thank you for a time of awakening. We praise you for it tonight. But we thank you for the honor of gathering together the freedom to be in public in a comfortable, convenient place. You've blessed us so much. We thank you for it. We thank you for a nation with a heritage of the Christian faith. Lord, that we can look at our buildings and our legal documents and the stories of our, those that have preceded us. And there's ample evidence of men and women who sought you. Lord, our desire is to return to you with our whole heart, not in pretense, but with our whole heart. Help us. Help us. Forgive us of our calloused hearts. Forgive us of our indifference. Holy Spirit, help us. Give us receptive hearts. Give us discernment beyond ourselves. Thank you for what you'll do. We praise you for it. We thank you, Lord, for the awakening that has begun. May it grow and multiply and increase. And we have to add services and add spaces and new screens to help with the people that want to come. May we need more pools. That we have to give up our free time to to lead small groups and to care for children. Lord, we are willing. Let righteousness increase. Let righteousness reign upon us once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You better give the Lord a hand, huh? God bless you. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.